give a class where we will discuss together important aspects of the Bergen Academy's admission test. Since you guys are here, I guess you're interested in the Bergen Academies, right? And you guys are probably uh, on track to start the admissions process, or you already did start the admissions process already. And in either case, you need to go as fast as possible. It's a very competitive test, a very competitive process, and it's a long process. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time. So the sooner you start, the sooner you get all your paperwork done, your applications ready, your application essay ready, your prep for the test, your um, recommendation letters from school, everything. As soon as you get everything ready, it's going to be better. So the sooner, the better. Okay. So if you didn't start already, or if you still didn't finish all the steps, I think you should do so as soon as possible. Now, you may be watching this class um, live or as a video when the uh, open houses still didn't start or when the open houses um, are already scheduled, you know, around these days or after the open houses are done. So I'm not really sure when or who will be watching this segment. But for those of you who are with us now live before the end of the open house um, dates for the Bergen Academies, I encourage you greatly to go attend the open house, uh, take a look at the school, speak with the people over there, understand the process, um, ask your questions. It's really important. It's super beneficial. Okay. Now, this is very important because you need to know the place where you're applying to and you need to know the process. Um, they have a, a cool checklist this year on the website. They didn't have this before where you can basically, you know, keep the print the paper or something in front of you or just copy it on something and keep it in front of you um, uh, in your room, on your desk, whatever, so that you always check that you're on track and that you're ready for everything. One more thing you need to add to that checklist is your test prep, getting ready for the test. And this is my job. This is basically what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, let's get into it. So here we go. Today's menu, ladies and gentlemen, we have five things we will be doing in today's class. Number one, we're going to have a quick overview of the Bergen County Academy's admission process. We're going to go over the admissions process, what you need to do, what you should have already done, what the next step is, and what to expect come February and come April of um, the following school year, okay? Or actually, it's this school year, so the following year. Popular math hacks for the BCA test, number two. Number three, important essay hacks for the BCA test. Number four, some study tips for the test, what to do from now till test day, how to study, how to prepare. And number five, tips for test day to actually use during the test, okay? Or right before the test. So let's get into this. First off, guys, let's have a quick overview about the seven academies that comprise or that the Bergen County Academy academies comprises. So the Bergen County Academies has seven academies, basically. Okay. Now we do have Bergen Tech, which is a different story. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with if you attended the open house and if this is where you are, um, you know, applying, or I know some of you may be applying to both the academies and Bergen Tech. So the basic um, seven academies are we have the one uh, the Science Academy, we, we call it Science Academy, Science and Tech. We have the Business Academy. We have the Culinary Arts Academy, Engineering, Medical, and Computer Science, and finally, Visual and Performing Arts. Okay, so um, quickly, those of you attending with us today, let me know in the comments, please, using the chat, what is your first Academy of Choice? Okay. And it's okay if you don't have one yet, but if you do, let me know. Okay, so we have one science and we have one engineering and we have one computer science. Okay, so you guys are varied and these are the, the actually the most popular, the engineering, computer science, um, science and technology. Medical is also one of the popular ones. Um, business is also popular. Um, it's interesting that some years business is really popular, some years it's not. But in most years, 
science, technology, computer science, engineering, and medical, these four are the most popular with fewer students applying to the culinary arts or visual and performing arts academies. Now, I need to tell you something though. Since most of you guys are interested in the popular academies, and by popular, I mean the academies that most students want to apply to, then you need to know that your competition is greater, okay? So it makes a difference. If there are a thousand students all applying to the Science and Technology Academy, but only 10 students applying to Culinary Arts Academy, you might have a better chance with Culinary Arts because there are very few students who are interested in entering that academy. You understand? So this is something you need to keep in mind. However, this does not mean by any chance that you should change the academy that you want to apply to based on the fact of which one is popular and which one is not. That would be a huge mistake. So don't understand me incorrectly here, okay? Now, what it does mean though, is that you need to have a clear perspective. You need to know what you're getting into, okay? If I'm applying to BCA, Bergen County Academies, which is a very competitive school, you have thousands of students from Bergen County who are applying to that same school with you, a lot of them are very good students, very smart students, students with very good grades, who are excellent in math and English, who will do very well on the test. You need to know the competition. So there is a lot of competition. Now, if you're applying to one of the popular academies, there's even a little bit more competition because this is where most people want to end up, okay? So you should study really hard. You should prepare for the test really, really well. You should get everything um, in order, all your paperwork, all your recommendation letters, all your, all, all your grades, because it's not an easy task, okay? It's very competitive and it is very difficult. I'm not scaring you off here. I'm just telling you that you need to understand the reality of how it is, okay? Let's move on. Now, let's go over a quick overview of the whole process, starting from when you first register and think about becoming a BCA student, all the way till getting your acceptance letter and starting the new school year as a ninth grader in BCA, okay? So basically we have three phases. Phase number one, in phase number one, you need to register online. Okay, you're gonna make an online account on the Bergen County, Bergen County Academy's website, okay? Um, you're gonna um, choose a username, a password, and you're gonna use your state student ID, SID or NJ Smart. okay? And you will submit an online application that has all your information. From school, you will need to get recommendation letters. So you're going to give recommendation forms to three teachers um, at school and a school transcript form to your guidance counselor or school official, principal, assistant principal, something like that. Now, the three teachers are going to send the three recommendation forms back to the school and your guidance counselor will do the same. So the school should receive all this from your school, but you are um, responsible for giving these forms to the three teachers in school and to the counselor in school. And my recommendation is to follow up. So if you give your teachers and you give your guidance counselor the papers, follow up after one or two weeks, ask them, okay, um, was my paperwork completed? Did you send my papers to the academies? Just make sure that you know that they remember and that they're on top of it just in case, okay? Then you're gonna have to print an admissions test ticket and this is what you will use to go on test day and take the actual test. And finally, you will take the test and this is why you guys are here to prepare for the test, okay? Now on test day, remember, you must bring the six digit validation number and student ID, these are things that um, the student ID should have it already, your school student ID, and the six digit validation number is something you should receive from them, okay? If you have any questions whatsoever about what the validation number is, um, what the admission test ticket should look like, should I print it in color, black and white, for example, uh, black, not black and white. So should I print it in black or should I print it in color? 
um, what kind of school ID do I need? I don't have a school ID. My school ID is old. Can I use my passport? Stuff like that. You need to ask them, okay? They're very, very strict about these, th these things. So make sure you ask them. The Bergen County Academies themselves. Don't research online. Don't ask me. Don't ask uh, your older brother or sister or friend who's in school. Go ask the school themselves, okay? Make sure you have everything in place. Now, after you finish this whole process, they will look at your test scores, and these are very, very important in determining whether or not you get into school. The scores, the results of your test. Even though there are no scores per se, and I'm going to explain this in a little while, but they look at your performance on the test along with your school grades, recommendation letters, and everything else. Then, in late February, and sometimes it's not very late in February, sometime in February, they will send decision letters to your home. The decision letter will have one of two things. They will either tell you, we are sorry, you did not pass phase one, we cannot accept you, God forbid, or they will send you a letter, which we all hope for. That letter is, congratulations, you've made it through phase one, we are inviting you to an interview. Okay, so if you get the interview letter, you go have an interview at the academies. You sit with some of the teachers over there. They ask you a few questions. They chat with you a bit, and then you go home. Mid-April, you get another letter, which is your final decision based on phase one, which was basically the test in your grades, and phase two, which was your interview. This letter will either say yes, you are in BCA officially, or no, we apologize. Okay? And you're done. If you do get the yes letter, which I hope all of you do, you will have to submit something called a declaration of intent, which is basically a piece of paper saying that you agree to become a student in Bergen County Academies. Like you didn't change your mind or anything from now all the way till April. Things change. Some people change their minds. Okay. So no, I didn't change my mind. Yes, I accept. Yes, I will start school at BCA next year. Okay. They're going to ask you afterwards to take a placement test sometime before the school year starts. And that's just a math and world language test. Um, you're in school. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what you do on this test. So just don't worry about it. It's not another test. There's only one test, this one right here. Okay, so this is just a placement test. So they know where to put you in class. If you're advanced, if you're not so advanced, what kind of languages you know so that they can just arrange their classes um, accordingly. But it's not a test for you to worry about or study for. Okay, now all this information is um, as accurate as possible and as recent as possible. It's directly taken from the Bergen County Academy's admissions guide to applying. And if you guys did not read the guide, the whole guide, you should. It's a PDF file you can find on their website. Okay. It's really important. Read that. Also read um, anything they have on the website about the academies, about the different academies. Research and know exactly um, what each academy offers, what you're going to learn in each of those, what the career, um, prospective careers for uh, graduates from this academy are. Um, how it will help you in the school, the college, university that you want to go to later on. So make sure you research all this. It's really important stuff because that's your future and nobody should be doing it for you. You should be the one who is interested and you should be the one who is trying to know what the future will look like for you. Okay. Um, so this is basically how the whole process goes. Now, it may look like it's a long process and it may look like there are a lot of factors. And that's true. There are a lot of factors. So if you do super well on the entrance test, but your school grades are terrible, or your three teachers sent in recommendation forms that basically do not recommend you at all, then you have a slim chance. On the other hand, if you have super good grades from school, you have excellent recommendation letters, then the test will actually make a huge difference whether you do well or not. The truth is, most students who are applying to BCA, like you guys, 
are smart kids who have good grades in school, whose teachers will probably write very good recommendation forms or letters. Okay. They probably don't have a problem there. Most of you. Okay. Or else you wouldn't take the chance. So the most important factor that they need to look at when determining who to choose is whether you like it or not, the entrance test. Because if most of the students applying to BCA have similar school grades, have similar recommendations from their teachers, the only thing that, you know, can, can keep them apart, like in two groups, good and bad, is the test. Okay? Now, I do have bad news about the test, and I'm going to go um, into more details in a little while. The test does not have a released score. And this is super frustrating to you as students and to me as your teacher, because we work so hard to try to get you guys to get a very good score on the test, you know, to, to get as many questions as possible right and as few questions as possible wrong. Okay. But at the end, they don't release a score. You are never going to know how you scored on the test. Okay, and that's really frustrating. I hate it, but that's the way it's been for years and years and years, and they don't intend on changing that. Okay, so you're going to have to study really hard. You're going to have to go take the test and do your super best, and then you are never going to know how well or how not well you did on the test. Okay, they only they will know what you did on the test, and they will factor this along with everything else to say yes or no and, and um, invite you to an interview or not, okay? But how well you actually did or what the score actually was, how many math questions you got right, how many math questions you got wrong, you will not know, okay? Okay, quick question. If we have a very good test grade, but bad school grades, it could go either way for us. This doesn't relate to me personally, just wondering. Yes, that's true, that's what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, um, Anjali, is that most students who have really bad school grades will probably not bother applying to BCA. Do you understand? That's what I'm saying. So most of the students who are applying already have good school grades. That's why, you know, they 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 took the step. Okay, that's why they're taking a, a class with me. That's why they're watching my YouTube videos. That's why they, they bought my book. That's why they're going to go and attend the, the open house and they're going to, um, do the application and take the forms to school. They already have good grades. If they had bad grades, they, they wouldn't, you know, bother doing that probably. Okay. Let's take a look at the other questions here really quickly. But before we do that, let's take a look at what the BCA test actually looks like. So as I said, the most important part of your process, in my opinion, is the test because when it all, it all boils down to one simple thing that the test is the only fair method to choose between you guys all the people um, applying to BCA because, you know, grades from different schools are not very equivalent. Recommendation letters from different teachers in different schools are not very equivalent. Only the test that's one standard test that all students take can actually be something that I can compare you all together. So it's a very important factor, if not the most important factor. Okay. Let's go do this really quickly. Let me tell you what the two parts are. And then I'm going to start looking at some of the questions that you guys sent me and some of the questions that I prepared for you. So first of all, the BCA test, Bergen County Academy's test, is divided into two parts. The first part is your essay. And this will be just one essay that you need to write in 45 minutes. The second part of the test is a math test. 60, sorry, 40 questions in 60 minutes. One more time. So you only have two parts for your test. Essay, 45 minutes. Math, 60 minutes, one hour, okay? The math test has 40 questions and the essay test has just one essay. Easy? Super easy. Now, this shows that the total time for the whole test is supposed to be one hour and 45 minutes, right? You should um, probably take about three hours during test. Okay, so you will be in the test 
room for about three hours, even though the actual test is one hour, 45 minutes. Okay. But they need to give you instructions before the test starts. They need to distribute the papers. They need to take them back. You need to fill in the bubble sheet, you know, where you put in your, your answers for the multiple choice part of the math. You need to hand them back in. They need to count and make sure everything is in place and then they dismiss you. So it takes about three hours. Okay. But the actual test will be one hour, 45 minutes, one hour for math, 45 minutes for essay. Now in today's class, in our course, we cover everything you need to know for math, everything you need to know for essay. In today's class, we're going to try to have an overview about the most important aspects of both. In our course, we go into details and cover everything you should be ready for and everything you should know. Okay. So let's go into a couple of questions here. First question, do you have to do particularly poor on the interview to not be accepted? Or is it just as hard as the test? So the question basically means if I do really well on the test, okay, and I get the interview letter, is the interview another test? No, the interview is much easier. If, if you understand what I mean by easier here than the test in terms of whether it determines, um, if or not you become a student in BCA. So I had the statistics from a previous year or previous years. Um, I don't have it now. I don't really remember the numbers, but it was something like just for, you know, for, for example's sake. So, so try to pay attention here. Let's say, let's say we have a thousand students who are applying to BCA this year. For example, when you go take the test, only about 30% of the students get the letter for the interview. So that basically means that 30% almost do well on the test. If this is the only determinant and 700 students, which is 70% do not get the interview letter. Okay. So about 30% of those taking the test and applying do well enough on the test along with everything else to get the interview letter. Then those 300 students, they go to their interview. Now here, the percentages differ. And I honestly don't remember what the statistics were. So this is just an example to show you which one is more important than the other, but don't quote me on these numbers. Okay. After the interview, about 200 students, for example, get accepted and about 100 get rejected. Okay. So 200 out of 300, that's about 60%. Okay. So here only 30% passed the test to the next phase. And from the interview, a whole 60% will pass the interview phase and become students at school. Okay. Now these numbers are all made up, but it just basically looks something like this. So the, the hardest part is the test. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you this out of experience. Okay. Um, let's say in, in any given year, when I have my course, I have my students like you guys, about 70% of them do well on the test and get the interview letter. Okay. Now, of those 70% that go to the interview, about 70% of them, or maybe 80% of them become students in BCA and only a little fraction, like 10%, 20%, 25%, 30% maximum don't make through, don't make it to the next phase. So if you pass the test and you get the interview letter, your chances are now really, really big. Now, one thing though, that some people ask me about the interview, and this is really important to so pay attention, please. Do we not pass the interview because of something we did or said? Is there something I should avoid saying or doing on the interview? Is it a test? No, it's not a test. It's basically saying we have now 500 students, for example, and of these 500 students, we need to accept some and refuse some. We have to, we don't have space for 500 students. So who are we going to accept and who are we going to? apologize to. So we have the interview, we get to know the students and we see, well, I think these students are a good fit. Okay. The way they think, 
um, the way they talk, the ideas they have, they're a good fit for our school. They're going to do well. It's good for them. So let's accept them. These students, I think they're in the wrong place. Okay, they may be smart. They may be good and everything, but they're in the wrong place. They won't do well in school. They won't like BCA. So we're going to apologize to them. So it's not really something you can do well or not well. It's their determination of whether you're a good fit or not for school. So they're, they're going to be thinking about you in the interview. Okay, it's not, they're not going to be thinking about them. They're going to be thinking about you. Are you going to succeed and be happy in our school? Then we're going to take you. We don't think you will be based on our um, experience with other students, years and years and years of experience. Then we're going to tell you, no, don't come. Um, when we do reach the interview phase, though, hopefully I'll have a class for you guys, uh, a video, a live video. We're going to do something and I'll help those of you who did uh, get the interview letter. I'm going to help you with some tips on what to do and what not to do during the interview. Okay, but you shouldn't worry about the interview now at all. If you do well on the test and get the interview letter, you're a genius. Okay, so, so, so few people do reach that point. So work on that and forget the interview for now. Okay, another question. Personally, I've had great school grades this year. Well, last year they were just okay. How does this impact my chances? Now, this is a very important question. And, you know, let me just go off topic here for a bit. And um, I hope I'm not boring you guys, okay? But I, I really think what I'm saying is important. And I hope I'm right. The whole process of applying to BCA is so similar to the process of applying to colleges, to universities later on in high school. So you really need to take this experience and learn from it because you will be doing something very similar to this in a couple of years when you're applying to university, okay? Now, the question is, my grades in seventh grade were okay. They weren't terrible, they were okay. In eighth grade, this year, my grades are, wow, I'm doing really, really well. Is this good or bad? I think it's extremely good, okay? It's even better than if your grades in seventh grade were great and your grades in eighth grade were also great. Why? Because any person who evaluates a student based on his or her grades whether it is um, a, a person evaluating you for Bergen Academies um, for high school or a person evaluating you in uh, 11th grade to um, or 12th grade when you're applying to college, they want to see progress, okay? If you were a, let's say, uh, a 90% student in seventh grade, but in eighth grade, you're a 100% student, this is really, really good. It even looks better than if you were 99% in seventh grade and 99% in eighth grade, because I can see you bridged the gap. I can see you did better. Even if you were a 70% student in seventh grade, but now in eighth grade, you're a 95% student. Wow, you did well. You improved yourself, yourself. And this is something they want to see, okay? So for now and for when you apply to college, and when you, when you guys are, are finishing up high school, it's really important that whoever's evaluating you see a, um, a gradual improvement or increase. They don't want someone who's always perfect. They want to see um, a story, okay? So yeah, they want to see, well, he wasn't that good, but now look at him. Look what he could do. If he wants to do it, he can. This is the story they want to see, okay? Perfect. Great. Okay. I'm happy to hear that. Let's take a look at some frequently asked questions. We, we started the frequently asked questions with questions that you guys asked me. These are some questions um, that were taken directly from the Bergen County Academy's admissions guide to applying. And as I said before, do read the guide. It's important. So there are a lot of questions there. I chose some of the most popular questions, the ones that I usually receive with the answers from BCA directly. So these are not my answers. Okay, let's go. Question number one. Do the admission criteria for the different academies vary? Important. What does that mean? If I want to attend Academy number one or Academy number two or Academy number seven, the different academies we talked about before, does the criteria, do the criteria, because criteria is a plural word, do the criteria for the admission for each of these academies differ? Let's see the answer. The criteria 
are the same for all academies, except the Academy for Visual and Performing Arts focuses on the student's audition or portfolio as well. So no matter what academy you are applying for, the criteria are the same, your school grades, um, your recommendation letters, your score on the BCA admissions test, it's all going to be the same. Okay. They're not going, that means that for example, but wait a minute, that that's what they, hmm, that's what they're implying, but not, it's not necessarily true. Listen up. That if I'm applying to engineering, the engineering academies, and I do super well on the math test, but I don't do so well on the essay test. Is that the same for all the academies? Well, no, because engineering is all math. So he's a math genius. He's not so good in English, but he's a math genius. He wants he's applying to engineering. So, you know, why not? That's something they may think. Here it implies that it doesn't make any difference. But does it not really make a difference? Or do they put this in consideration? You can't tell for sure. I've heard students who told me this, you know, it's like gossip, that if you're applying to um, an academy that focuses on math, then you need to do really well on the math test. But if you're applying to a car, an academy that doesn't really focus on math, it doesn't make really, you know, matter if you don't do that well on math, that's gossip, okay? The official answer is it's all the same. Now, maybe it would differ in the interview phase, perhaps, yes, okay? What does that mean? So let's say um, Matthew and Zachary, Matt and Zachary, both um, got past phase one, they did really well, they got the interview letters, okay? And now they are in the interview together. And they're both applying to the Engineering Academy. Engineering Academy is very math-centric. There's a lot of math in engineering. Matt, because of his name, is a math genius. Matt and math. Zach is not so good in math. Do you think this is something that they will look at during the interview? Perhaps. Yes. Okay. They don't say here that they will. They don't say that they won't. Okay. But perhaps. Now, in my opinion, I you need to be on the safe side. The way I play this game is get 100%. So my advice to you is get 100% in the math portion. Get 100% in the essay portion. Okay. Do perfectly well on the test and forget about all this. Next one. Are there limits on how many students can be accepted from one town? Now, this is another important question. But before I answer this question, let me tell you that whenever anybody sends me this question, I worry. Why? Because what they're basically thinking is, my town has a lot of students applying to BCA. And most of those students are really smart students. So I don't really stand a chance. My friend lives in a town where very few students are applying to BCA and most of them are not so smart. So he has a much better chance. Okay. So you start to give yourself um, a kind of excuse. You understand? You give yourself an excuse before you even try studying, before you even go and take the test. It's like, yeah, well, I live in this town and there are we have like 500 students applying to BCA. I have a really, really slim chance, even if I do really well on the test. So you're giving yourself an excuse. And this negative negativity will, you know, not help you. It will be detrimental to you. It will be, um, yeah, exactly. You're going to have a big problem. So don't think that way. Anyway, let's answer the question. Are there limits on how many students can be accepted from one town? Yes, there is a limit on the number of students we can accept from a high school district. That number is based on the enrollment of the local high school, which basically means if, um, let's say, uh, let's see, in Hackensack, for example, we have 1,000 high school students, okay? And in, hmm, tell me, Teaneck, okay? We have 500 high school students. Just an example, okay? Now, we will accept only 10% from each town. 
So what's 10% from Hackensack? That's 100 students. What's 10% from Teaneck? That's 50 students. Okay, so the Bergen County Academies can only accept a maximum of 100 students from Hackensack and a maximum of 50 students from Teaneck. That's basically what their answer says, okay? The numbers are all made up. I have no idea how many high school students there are in Hackensack or Teaneck. Okay, if anybody knows, let me know. So, this is basically what they're saying. But here there's another factor. If you live in Hackensack, does this mean that you have a better chance of becoming a student in BCA because BCA will take a whole hundred students from Hackensack? And your chance if you lived in Teaneck would be worse because it's only going to take 50 students from Teaneck? Yes or no? What do you think? That's, this is a math question. It's a question that can come on the test. Okay. I hope it does. Hmm. Tell me. If VCA will accept a maximum of 100 students from Hackensack and a maximum of 50 students from Teaneck, does this mean that your chances of becoming a VCA student are greater if you live in Hackensack than if you lived in Teaneck? Yes or no? Okay. Statistically, if you look at the numbers, perhaps yes. But if you look at how they accept students, it will be a no. Why? Because how many students from Hackensack are applying to VCA? What if there are 99 students applying from Hackensack to VCA? Well, maybe you do have a good chance. But what if there are 900 students from Hackensack applying to VCA? Then you probably have a very slim chance because they will only accept 100 out of 900 people. Okay? Whereas in Teaneck, what if you have 100 students applying, but we're only going to take 50? Well, that's not bad because you're taking 50 out of 100 who applied. Here, if you have 900 students applying and you're only going to take 100, that's a much smaller percentage. That's one thing. The other thing is, it's all about competition. It's all about how good your grades are and how good you do on the test. So what difference does it make if a thousand students from my town are applying but I'm the smartest, I'm the best, I will do the best on the test, I have the best grades. Does it make a difference how many other people are applying to you? Doesn't make any difference to you, right? Because you are the top of all of these people. On the contrary, if only five students are applying and you're one of those five, but you're the worst one, you're the last one, the four are much better than you are, then you have a very bad slim chance. Okay? Good. Next one. Can my son change his first choice academy once he has applied? A popular question I get a lot, and here the answer is directly from Bergen Academies. They say yes. Choices can be changed until Friday, January 20th, and this, I believe, was from um, 2018. So based on the year you're applying, it will differ, the deadline but it will be after the test, okay? Once a student has been accepted into one of our academies, the preferences cannot be changed. Now, this is really important. Remember when I told you before that if you are applying to a popular school, a popular academy, you might have a harder time getting into that academy than if you were applying to one of the um, less popular academies, remember? Now, it really won't make a difference before the test or until the test. Why? Because till test day, it doesn't really make a difference. The criteria are the same, like we said. But according to them, somewhere in the third, second or third week in January, after the test has been done, you cannot change your preference. So that means that they may put which academy you are applying to as part of the decision of whether to send you the interview letter in February or not. I'm going to say this one more time. Now, again, this is all my speculation, okay? So that nobody, um, you know, misquotes me. Bergen County Academies are very secretive about the admissions process, okay? We don't know exactly what happens. But what they say is the criteria are the same. So no matter what academy you are applying to, it's the same for everybody. But they also say that you cannot change your choice of academy 
after a certain date in January. That means that by January 20th, for example, they know for sure each student applying to VCA wants to go to which academy, and you cannot change it. Okay? Now, will this affect how they choose who gets the interview letter in February or not? Perhaps, most probably does. Okay? Anyway, once you do get accepted after the interview and after the whole process is done, so in April, probably when you get accepted, you cannot change anything. And again, the wording here may imply that once you get the interview letter, you cannot change anything as well. So we're not really sure what it means once a student has been accepted. Is it the interview letter or is it the actual acceptance letter in April? However, they do say that choices can be changed until January 20th, and this is the date for one of the years, so it's going to be around that time, which basically means that after that you can't change it. So, you know, so you cannot change after a certain date. You can change, though, until the date they have. And if you want to know what this year's date is, ask them directly. Don't rely on anything written anywhere. Ask them directly. Make sure you know what the updated date is. Next question. What was my daughter's score on the entrance test? And this is one of the questions um, I get a lot. And it's one of the questions that, as I said before, um, you know, touch on an important issue, something that I really um, am frustrated with, something I do not like. Okay, but it's, you know, they put the rules and it's it's their, um, you know, responsibility to, to manage the whole thing the way they see fit. But in my personal opinion, I do not like this. What is this? Your score on the entrance test will remain a secret forever, okay? You'll never know what you did on the test. They will not tell you, okay? You do your best. They'll score the test. They'll have some kind of score, okay? A number, a letter, a percentage. They will have something that represents the score you did on the test, but they will not tell it to you no matter what. Due to the highly confidential nature of the admissions process, and to keep it unbiased for all applicants, we do not discuss how decisions are reached, the reasons why an applicant is not accepted, or why one applicant is selected over another. Additionally, we do not release an applicant score on the entrance test. Since it is not a norm test, there is no way for applicants to know what the scores represent, and it would cause needless competition. Now, I do not agree with this final sentence here. Okay, not being a normed test doesn't mean anything. Okay, you have 40 math questions. You can tell me how many I got right and how many I got wrong. That's it. Okay, that's all I want. Essay, okay, I understand. You may not be able to give me um, a, a, you know, a number or a letter for essay that I can understand fully, but maybe you can tell me, well, essays are graded according to three letter grades, A, B, and C. You got an A, you got a B, you got a C. What does that mean? I don't have to tell you, but you need to know what you did. As for math, it's even easier because the questions, you know, the answer is either right or wrong. It's a multiple choice test. So I think they should tell you. They don't want to tell you. And this is the way it's been for many years. So don't expect anybody to tell you what you did. It's frustrating, but you need to know it from now. Okay. Okay. Um, quick question. What if I do really well on the test, but other people do even better? Do I still have a chance? Nobody knows. Because as I said, they will not release the score. So you can't compare your scores to anybody else's. You, you can't know that your friend, John, um, got two questions more correct than you did. And that's why John got the interview letter and you didn't, for example. You'll never know. But what the question means is, what if I, you know, I feel I did really, really well? But there were like two questions that I, you know, I guessed on, two questions I wasn't really sure about. So I think I got 38 questions right out of 40. I may be wrong in two, so, you know, maybe 36 out of 40, 35 out of 40, not less than that. I really think that's what I got. What do you think? Me. I think that's a great score if you got 38 out of 40, you got 36 out of 40, you did really well. But how do I not know that there are a thousand students who got 40 out of 40? I have no Okay, so you won't know. That means you have to do your best. So, summary, guys. To summarize, what should I do on the test 
in order to feel that I have a good chance of getting my interview letter. I should do my very best. I should try to get 100% full mark, nothing wrong. Okay? Now, is this possible? It definitely is. Is it probable that I don't miss one question? Not quite. Okay? You may miss one or two questions. Most people will. But you should aim to getting 100%, nothing wrong. But you can do that on test day out of thin air. You need to prepare before. So if you prepare really well, you study really well, you take a class, you take a course like our course, you um, read books, you do a lot of practice, and you go to the test feeling prepared and you do your very best, you should not worry about anything else. But if you underprepare, if you don't get ready for the test the way you should, then you will have a problem on test day. Okay? Great. So to summarize everybody from our live class for the Bergen County Academy's admission test, the test is the most important part of the process. It is the one part that they will probably look to the most when they try to decide who gets in and who doesn't. The test is very difficult, very competitive. You should do your best because you're not going to know your score. So you should work really hard from now all the way till test day. If you are unprepared or underprepared, you will do not well. You will do really, really badly on the test. But if you prepare really, really well, you will do very, very well. Remember, it's a competitive test. You have a lot of smart students taking the test with you, and you have a lot of smart students who are preparing for the test now. So don't fall behind, get ready, start preparing, start working so you can get in. Okay? Okay. Now, let's move on to number two. So let me go up here again. Let's remember what we had today on our menu. So number one, we got our overview of the BCA admission process. And I have been talking for so long. I've said a lot of things. And when I do that, I get scared. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Just give me some reassurance here. Did you benefit from what I said? You can say yes, no, or something in between. So we have one yes, two yeses, three yeses, four yeses. Okay, great. And let's see everybody else, the other people attending with us on Facebook, on our live group. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow, yes. So I got a hundred yeses, a thousand yeses. Okay, so I got a lot of yeses. So good job, guys. They're not a thousand, but a lot of yeses. Number two, we will work now on some popular math hacks for the BCA test. I'm going to teach you some hacks. Some of them are going to seem really, really simple, um, intuitive. Some of them may seem like, oh, why didn't I think of that before? And I hope you benefit from them. I have uh, a few. We're going to take the hack and we're going to take an example. Throughout our course, our long course, uh, we have so, so many hacks because we do a lot of practice. And every time there's a question that has some kind of hack that we can use, I go into details and we write it together. But that's in the course. For today, I chose some of the most popular, some of the ones that we use a lot during the test. We're going to go over those now. Then we're going to talk about the essay a bit and some study tips for now and for test day. Okay? Now, here's what I want you guys to all do. I want you to get a notebook and a pen or pens or pencil or pencils because you will be writing after me. Okay? And I want your attention, your complete attention. Okay? Okay, everyone, today we are going to talk about some of the most popular math hacks that we need to know for the BCA test, for the Bergen Academy test. Now, first of all, why do we have such a thing as math hacks, math tricks, math shortcuts? Okay, they all mean the same thing. Well, number one, it's because there are two things that some people or most people do not understand about the BCA test. Number one is the time on the test. You need to be really quick on the test. You have 40 questions in 60 minutes, and that's not a lot of time. So you need to work quickly on the test or else you're going to miss some questions and you will not have time to answer these questions. Number two, the second reason most people do not know or appreciate 
um is that on the test you cannot use calculators. No calculator. Okay? So, since you cannot use a calculator, and since you will be tight with time, the time isn't going to be good on the test, you need to learn some math hacks, math tricks, math shortcuts, so you can answer questions without using a calculator quickly. Understood? Okay. So I chose a few for you guys. Let's start really with a really easy one. So hack number one for today is going to be called always draw hack. It's very simple. It basically says, write with me please, that whenever a question has a shape or shapes, you should draw a sketch, okay? A quick drawing of whatever the question is asking you about. Now, this is really intuitive, really simple, really basic, but it's one of the most important hacks because as you guys know, the test is limited in time. You don't have a lot of time, okay? And when you don't have a lot of time, you as a student try to go quickly. You know, you want it, you're in a rush. So when you find a question that has a shape, like a square, a circle, a rectangle, something like that, you may tend to just, you know, do it in your head or start crunching the numbers without actually drawing the shape because you think there's, you know, there's no, not much time and there's no purpose of having to draw. So the question says a square has a side length of five. Well, I don't have to draw a square. I mean, that's easy. But experience says that when you have a question on the math test, the BCA test, that involves any kind of shape. If you draw it and start putting whatever information you have on the drawing, you probably save time and you don't fall into the trap or traps that they prepare for you because the test has many traps. Okay, the questions are not easy. They're tricky. Okay. So let's take a quick example, and this is really simple. What is the area in square kilometers of a square lot with a perimeter of 12 kilometers? As I said, it's easy. You can start doing it right away. But if you want to be on the safe side and you want to do what the hack says and you don't want to get any mistakes, you should draw the square first. Okay? Okay. A square lot with a perimeter of 12 kilometers. Now take note here and pay attention please if you had not drawn this figure do you know what most people would do on the test if they were in a hurry they would think that 12 kilometers was the side length of the square and they would say well area equals side times side side squared in a square so it's 12 times 12 144 okay i bet you a lot of students would do that but if you draw the square and you want to put the number 12, where am I going to put it? Here? Is that, oh no, wait a minute. It says a perimeter of 12. That's different. That's different. So the perimeter is 12. What is the perimeter of the square? It's four times the side length, right? Side plus side plus side plus side. So each of the sides here on this square is equal to how much? Hmm. Yes, three kilometers. So each side is three. Now I want to find the area. Okay, area equals three times three. So it's nine square kilometers. Okay, guys? So very easy question, very easy drawing, nothing to it at all. I actually chose this. This is a real BCA question, okay? All the questions I have for you are questions that either appeared before or from released tests or very similar to them, okay? So this is a really simple question. But the point is, if you draw, you save time, you get the right answer. If you do not draw, you waste time, you probably do not get the right answer, okay? Okay. Next hack. Hack number two, negatives and exponents hack. Now, there are a lot of things involving exponents, 
In our course, we cover exponents in full. We take all the rules, we learn all the hacks. Here I just have one important hack that relates to exponents that I want to make sure that you guys understand. What is negatives here? What do I mean by negatives? I mean the number that is raised to the exponent, the base, okay? So if you have five squared or you have negative five squared, what is the difference in the answer? Nothing. The answer is 25 in both cases. But if you have five cubed, five to the power three to the third, and negative five with the exponent of three, the answer is different. What's the answer for the first one right here? What's five to the power of three? Five cubed, five exponent three. What's the answer? Yes, five to the power of three means five times five times five, which is 125. What about negative five all cubed? It's negative 125. So what is the hack? The hack is the following, okay? Make sure that you understand what kind of exponent keeps the negative sign as it is and what kind of exponent does not keep the negative sign as it is. Take a look at the two examples underneath each other on the right. Here we had negative squared. The answer is positive. Here we had a negative cubed. The answer was negative. So the rule basically is if you have a negative base, a negative number raised to an even exponent, the answer will be positive. Two is an even exponent. And if you have a negative base that is raised to an odd exponent, then your answer is going to be negative. Just like three here is an odd exponent. Okay? Now, you need to realize that the exponents here are positive. So it's positive two and positive three. We're not getting into negative exponents here, okay? Do you understand, guys? Now, this is super important. Well, wait a minute. You just told us that this is a hack. This doesn't really look like a hack. This looks more like a rule. This is something you know we learn in school. We all know that if you have a negative base, you raise it to an even exponent, you get a positive answer. If you have a negative base raised to an odd exponent, you get a negative answer. We know that already. We took this in school. This is not a hack. A hack is something that saves you time. It's something that is more of a shortcut. This isn't really a shortcut. Yes, it is. If you use it the way I will right now, take a look. Calculate the following. Look at this question and tell me, how could you guess, how could you make an educated guess on a question like this on the test if you have very, very, very little time, okay? You need to eliminate two answers or something and guess from the other answers. You don't have time to calculate anything. Here's what you need to do. Pay attention. Negative number raised to a positive, sorry, to an even exponent. We're not talking about positive or negative exponents now, okay? So I have negative 0 0.5 to the power 2, and 2 is even. This means that the answer of this, whatever it is, is going to be a positive number or a negative number? A positive number. Then we have plus. Then we have another positive number. No negatives here. So the answer has to be what? Positive. You can eliminate C and D right away. Do you understand? Okay, well, that saved me some time, but I still need to calculate. Well, not really. Why? Because we have another hack. Let me just give you, uh, let me write the hack first. So do you understand, guys, what I just did now? Let me say this again. How do we use the hack that we learned a little while ago? When you have a negative number raised to an even power, your answer is positive. 
When you have a negative number raised to an odd power, the answer is negative. How do we use this as a hack on the test? Something like this. You have negative to the power 2, so you know that this is going to be positive, plus something else that's already positive. So your answer must be positive at the end. You only have three positive answers, A, B, and E. So instead of choosing between five answers, I can only choose between three now. So that's even better. Well, is there another hack? I think there is. Let's take a look. Okay, guys, pay attention. Another hack we will learn today. Let's call it hack number three, okay? It's when you have exponents with numbers greater or less than one. Pay attention. What does this mean? If you have five squared, what's the answer going to be? 25, correct? What if you have 0 0.5 squared? What is the answer going to be? Hmm, who knows? It will be 0 0.25. Do you agree or not? You do. Let's take another example. Let's say you have uh, 4 squared, 16. What if you have 0 0.4 squared? What's the answer? 0 0.16. Okay. Now, we all know this. Where is the hack? It's coming, pay attention. The number that was greater than one, like five and four, when raised to a positive exponent, like the power two exponent two squared, the answer resulting was a number bigger than the original number. One more time. If you have a number greater than one, like five or four, and you raise that power to an exponent, you square it, for example, like we did here, okay? The answer, the result, is a number that is bigger than the original number. So here we had 5, here we have 25. Here we had 4, here we have 16. Makes sense. If you got a number and you multiply it by itself, raise it to a power, once or twice or three times or whatever, the number keeps on getting bigger. However, if that number is less than 1, like 0 0.5, less than 1, or 0 0.4, less than 1, when you raise it to a power, to an exponent, a positive whole number exponent, okay, you get a smaller number. You see this? 0 0.25 is smaller than 0 0.5. Do you know this or not? If you don't, you're in deep trouble, okay? You need to compare the same place values to each other. So this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.25. 0 0.5 is bigger than 0 0.2, okay? So when you raise a number, less than 1 to a power, you get a smaller answer. Here, when you raise 0 0.4 to a power, you get a smaller answer. Instead of 0 0.4, you get 0 0.16. Okay? And you need to compare the 4 to the 1. Forget about the 6 for now. Do you understand, guys? If anybody does not understand this part, please let me know now. Okay? This is not the hack yet. This is just a basic math rule that you should all know. If anybody does not understand, tell me now. How am I going to use this as a hack? Let me show you. Take a look at this example, guys. Now, we used this example in a previous hack. Let me remind you really quickly. It was called positive-negative hack. Basically, it said that a negative number squared is going to give me a positive answer. Then you have plus. Then you have a positive number squared, so another positive number. The answer has to be positive. 
So we can eliminate C and D because both of these answers are negative answers. Easy? Easy. Now, look at the three remaining numbers. Do we need to calculate here? No, we can use another hack. Which hack? The one hack. What is the one hack? Smaller or greater than one. So if you have 0 0.5 squared, okay, forget about the negative for now. So a number smaller than one squared, the answer is going to be what? Small. It's going to be smaller than 0 0.5. If you have 0 0.4 squared, the answer is going to be a small number. It's going to be smaller than 0 0.4, like we said before, correct? So the answer can in no way be 4.1 or 41, because these numbers are huge. And when we square numbers, the result is going to be smaller than the original number because they're less than 1. That leaves you with only one answer B. I could actually answer this question in about 10 seconds without having to calculate what the square of 0 0.5 is or what the square of 0 0.4 is. Compare this to the traditional method, which is 0 0.5 all squared, and then you either memorize it or you do it on paper because you can't use a calculator, so you figure out the answer is 0 0.25. Then you go 0 0.4 squared, and you figure out it's 0 0.16. Then you add these two together. 6 plus 5 is 11, so 1 carry 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 0 points, so the answer is B. Instead of doing all this, you could just do the two hacks I did. Well, I don't really think this saved a lot of time. This blue method right here could have been done really quickly. Okay, what if your question looked like this. Calculate for me negative 0 0.723 all squared plus 0 0.612 all squared. Can you do this without a calculator really quickly and efficiently and get the right answer? No, you cannot. But what you can do is you can realize that a negative number squared is positive plus another positive number, so you eliminate the two negatives. Done. This is a, a decimal number less than one, zero point something. This is a decimal less than one, zero point something. When you square those, you're going to get even smaller numbers. So it's impossible that the answer would be four point something or 41. It has to be a decimal, so it's B right away. Okay? This is how we think on the test, and this is one of the very, very important hacks. Understood? Say yes. If you understand, please say yes. Okay, in the comment box, chat box, say yes, yes, yes. Okay, understood. Now I said say yes, not understood. Okay, everyone. Now let's move on to another important hack. Hack number what? What, what number is this in today's class? How many hacks did we take today so far? Is this number four? Okay. Let's go. Hack number four. Proper or improper fractions hack. Take a look. Pay attention. Okay. What is three over one plus three over nine plus one over eight? Okay. Do not calculate the answer. Tell me really quickly, will the answer be, will the answer be 3 over 2, or will it be 2 over 5? Now, the answer is neither, okay? But let's just say the answer is one of those two. Could you tell me which one will be the right answer without calculating anything? You should be able to. The answer will probably be this one. Now, again, guys, this is not the correct answer, okay? But it will be close to this one. It will not be close to this one. Why? Using the proper or improper fractions hack. What's a proper fraction? A proper fraction is a fraction where the numerator 
is smaller than the denominator. So 2 thirds, 2 over 3 is called a proper fraction. An improper fraction is a fraction where the numerator is bigger than the denominator, like 3 over 2. Do you understand? Now, if you have a question like this, before you calculate anything, you can use this hack. How? The numerator here is 3. What about the denominator? It is 1 plus a very small fraction, something less than half. 3 over 9 is less than half because 3 over 6 is half. So 3 over 9 is even smaller than half. Plus 1 eighth, so a very little number. So you have 1 plus a little number, fraction, a decimal, 0 point something, plus another little number, 0 point something. The answer is going to be an improper fraction. The numerator is going to be bigger than the denominator. So 3 bigger than 2, so it's going to look like this. It's impossible for it to be 2 over 5 because here the numerator is bigger than the denominator, but here the numerator is smaller than the denominator. Now, one more time, guys. These are not actual numbers. This does not equal this or that, okay? I'm just showing you how you can guess quickly using this hack. Why don't I show you a real question? Let's do it. Here's a question. Calculate the value of this. Ooh, pay attention. Look, it's 3 over 2 minus something. Pay attention. 2 minus something means a number smaller than 2, correct? And the numerator is 3. So the answer has to be a what? An improper fraction. It's going to be 3 over something, correct? The numerator must be bigger than the denominator, big over small, because here we have 3 and here we have 2 minus something, so it's even smaller than 2. Okay, can the answer, guys, be e? No. Why? Because e is 3 over 4, and here we have a proper fraction. We have the smaller number on top and the bigger number, number at the bottom, which is not what we expect. So this is wrong. What about D? Wow, same thing, 4 over 9. We have a small number on top. We have a big number at the bottom. And that's opposite to what we're expecting. What about 9 over 4? Yes, it could, because 9 is the big number over 4, which is the small number. Can it be 0? Impossible, because it's 3 over 2 minus something. So it won't be 0. OK, there's no way for it to be 0. Can it be 4? Impossible. Can 3 over something equal 4? And this something is something that's smaller than 3. Pay attention. It's 3 over a little under 2. 3 over 2. 3 over 1 and a half. No way for it to be 4. That's bigger than 3. That's impossible. The answer is C right away. And I was able to answer this question without calculating anything. I will ask you guys a question. And I want you to write agree or disagree. My question is, do you think this, or actually it's agree or not agree, so, so it's not going to be do you think. The question is, agree or disagree with the following statement. This hack will be super duper, something bigger than duper, useful on the test if we have a question like this. 3 plus 1 over 4 plus 2 over 5 over 2 minus 1 over 4 minus 2 over 7. Imagine if you have a question like this on the test and you're going to have to calculate the denominator and the numerator. You will take so much time. But what about if you use this hack? It will be so much easier. Agree or disagree? You guys agreed before I asked. Okay. Do you understand? So let's take this example right here. You have 3 plus a little bit plus a little bit. So you know that the numerator is at least 3. It's a little bit bigger than 3. The denominator is 2 minus a little bit minus a little bit. So the denominator is 2 or less than 2. So you have the big number on top, the small number at the bottom. No matter how many times you get equivalents of this fraction, by multiplying or dividing by different factors, 
the truth will always remain that the numerator is going to be bigger than the denominator. It will always be big over small. Look at your answer choices, eliminate anything else. You get one right answer right away super fast. Easy? Easy. Hack number five today, guys, opposite answer choices hack. Now, it's really simple, really straightforward. It's something we use um, on the BCA test, we use on the SAT test, we use on the ACT test, on any multiple choice test. Basically says, if you find two answer choices that are the opposites of each other, one of these two choices is probably the right answer. So if you have answer A, 2 over 5, and answer B, 5 over 2, there is a very big chance that the correct answer is one of these two that it is not a coincidence that the test writer put two answer choices that are the opposites of each other. He or she, the test writer, put those two opposite answer choices exactly for this purpose, to mix you guys up so it's a trick. So one of them is probably the right answer. Now, what do I mean by opposites? Opposites could mean so many things. Here I'm going to take two cases, two popular cases. Case number one, what you have here, and this is when we have the reciprocals. Reciprocals. Okay? So two opposite answer choices are two fractions that are the reciprocals of each other. That's one thing. Another way of having opposite answer choices on the test is using positive and negative answers. So if you have two answer choices, one is positive 5 and the other is negative 5, there is a very big chance that one of these two is the right answer. Okay? Elaborate, please. Take a look here. What if I have something like this? Okay? Five answer choices like we do on the BCA test. So A is positive 5, B is positive 3, 6 is negative 7, and what, what's 6? Sorry. C is negative 7, and D is negative 5. And you need to make a very quick guess, okay? And E is 4, for example. Which of these five answer choices do you think is the best answer? It's either A or D. Why? Because we have two opposite answer choices. They're both similar, which is another hack. They're both five, but one is positive, one is negative. That means one is right, one is left. One is up, one is down. They're opposite in sign, okay? Therefore, one of them might be the right answer, and they're probably there to confuse you. Same thing if you have with reciprocals. Let's say you have A, 1 over 3. B, 2 over 5. C, 3 over 7, D, 5 over 2, E, 6 over uh, 5. You need to choose, you need to answer this question. But if you want to make a quick guess, there's a very big chance the best answers are B and D because they are opposites. Okay? Reciprocals. Now let's look at this question, for example. If you wanted to use this hack, you would realize, ladies and gentlemen, that answers C and D are both opposites. They are reciprocals of each other. Okay? Is this a coincidence that of the five answer choices, two of them are fractions that are reciprocals, the opposite of each other? It is not a coincidence in most cases. And the answer will, in fact, be one of those two. Now, remember this question we answered using the proper improper fraction hack. You guys remember? So we already know that the answer has to be an improper fraction, with the numerator being bigger than the denominator, using the old hack. Now we also realize that they're opposites. So the answer is C right away, without doing any calculation whatsoever. Okay? Example to just understand how important this is on the test. Let's say we have something like this. 3 plus 1 over 8 plus 2 over 7 plus 
be over 15, over 17. Over 2 plus 1 over 2 minus 3 over 8 minus 2 over 7. How do I answer this question? Super quickly, number one, you realize that the answer is going to be a big numerator over a small denominator. And you can do that just by looking at the numbers without making any calculations. Then you look at the answer choices and you find that answer choice C is 9 over 4. Answer choice D is 4 over 9. And these two are called opposites. Since they're opposites, then there's a big chance the answer is one of them. And since you know that the answer has to be big over small, then the only one that works is C. Now, is there a chance there's something wrong here? Is there a chance that they didn't use this hack or this trick here? There is a chance, but it's a slim chance. And if you're tight with time, if you're um, at the end of the test and you don't have enough time and you need to make a guess, this is a very, very efficient, straightforward, good way to guess. Okay. Now, let's take another example. This is another example on the hack that we learned about opposite answer choices. Here, if you look at the answer choices really quickly, don't even look at the question, you will find that we have two opposite answer choices. We have three and we have negative three. Big chance that the answer is one of these two because they are opposites. One of them is positive and one of them is negative. Easy? Easy. Great job, guys. Okay. Really quickly, was there a super quick, efficient way to answer this question on the test? Yes. How? Pay attention. Number one, using our opposites hack, we realize that answer C and answer D are opposite answer choices. Positive 3 in C, negative 3 in E. So we know the answer is probably one of those two. Now let's look here at the question itself. You have a positive times a negative number, so it's negative. Then you have minus a negative number. And when you have a negative number minus a negative number, it becomes positive. Right here you have negative 15, right here you have 10. Negative 15 plus 10 is negative 5. That means your numerator, before you even divide here, is going to be a negative number. It's negative 5 divided by 5 over 3. Without doing any calculation, you know the answer has to be negative. Now you have two similar opposite answer choices, C and E, and only E is negative, so you choose E right away. Easy? Easy. Okay. I'm done with today's math portion, okay? Um, I hope it was beneficial. I hope I opened your eyes um, to an important fact, or actually two important facts. Fact number one is that the Bergen County Academy's test tests everything you've learned in math until eighth grade, okay? There's some geometry, not a lot. There's a lot of algebra, if you want to call this algebra. Arithmetic, a lot. Order of operations, fractions, decimals, word problems, and there are a lot of tricks. But there are also a lot of hacks that you can use like the five we learned today, to help you find the correct answer quickly and efficiently, okay? You need to study math, the general math that you need to remember. So you need to, um, you know, freshen up everything in your mind about decimals, about fractions, addition, subtraction, exponents, uh, radicals, roots, percents, uh, some statistics, some geometry, um, ratios, proportions, all of these things, okay? You need to make sure you understand everything, you know everything, you remember everything. Then you need to practice a lot and you need to figure out and learn those hacks that you can use to get the answer efficiently on the test, okay? And this is what we do in our course. Our course is really comprehensive. We have, we cover everything um, that you need to remember as far as the math concept and rules, which may be really beneficial to some of you if you need this refreshment, or maybe quite useless for some of you if you have it all in your head, but at least it will organize things. Then we have the other portion of our course 
which is a lot of practice. And whenever we practice, this is how we practice. Like I do um, in front of you and like I did today. Basically, I don't try to answer the question just the way it should be answered. Okay. Like any, you know, math book or math teacher would, but in a way that, you know, puts into consideration that you can't use a calculator. You need to be fast. You need to be efficient. So we try to use shortcuts. We try to use hacks that will help us answer quickly and correctly on the test. Okay, guys. Okay. Now, we should start discussing our important essay hacks now. Quickly, I want to know, and this is something in general I ask all my students. So whether you're attending this live, whether you're watching this as a video, wherever you are, whenever you are, in the chat box, in the comments, answer my question really quickly. Do you fear the math portion or the essay portion of the test more? Which is scarier to you, math or essay? Which are you more worried about? Okay, so essay is probably the answer that most students answer. And this is actually scary because the essay part is really easy. And um, it's at, this is actually good. It's scary, but it's good because the essay portion on the test is really simple. If you know what you're doing and you practice and adjust your time, there are no problems when it comes to the essay portion. Okay. Um, the math portion is also easy if you're good in math and if you learn how to, to manage your time. The only thing that a lot of people don't understand is that if a lot of people feel confident with the math on the math section and they're okay with it, that means that most students who are taking the test are good in math and feel confident and are not worried about the math portion. And don't forget about the competition. So everybody else is good with math. That means everybody else can score really high on math. So you need to really focus on math as well because just getting one question wrong or two questions wrong can be the difference between getting in or out because everybody else is good in math. Okay. So we're going to cover the essay. We're going to talk about some hacks today. I'm going to give you, um, you know, a few tips and we're going to organize our thoughts. You can do a lot of essay practice um, in our course. The thing is, don't just focus on essay and definitely don't just focus on math. You need to focus on both because we do not know how the scores are interpreted. Remember, they don't tell us anything about the scores. So we need to do our very best on both math and essay and not worry about just one. Okay. Okay. So when it comes to the essay, we want to discuss a few things here. Okay. Number one, how much time do we have for the essay on the BCA test? We have 45 minutes. In the 45 minutes, you should do three things. Number one, you should read. Even though this is an essay test, a writing test, the first thing you should do is read. Because the way the essay is on the BCA test, it's a short story. You need to read the short story or the article. And then after reading the short story, you need to write an essay answering a question on that story. Understood? Okay. So the first thing you need to do is read the story. Now, let me just say this. This is the way the writing test, the essay test has been on the Bergen Academy's test for many, 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 many years. Okay. They have not changed this format. Short story, question on the short story. You write an essay answering the question and you bring proof, evidence, quotes from the story. Now, it is possible that they change this any time without notice, hopefully with notice. But in all cases, this is usually how it's been or this is how it has been for many years. And it's usually how it's going to be next time around. OK, so number one, you need to read the story. Number two, you need to write your essay. And number three, you need to revise what you've written. How should I divide my time between these three things? I will give you a guide to start with. That does not mean that you will always have to stick 
to the division of time that I will give you now. You should vary this according to your own experience. Okay? So the more you work by yourselves, the more you practice, okay, whether you attend our course or not, whether you practice using my material and my videos, my books, or you practice by yourselves, you need to adjust your time so that you can always finish the whole essay in 45 minutes or under 45 minutes successfully. The guide I will give you to start with is as follows. Five minutes reading the story at the beginning. Then we have 35 minutes writing the actual essay and five minutes revision on everything you've written, correcting any spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, rewriting sentences that don't look good, making sure that everything looks good. Now, some people like to spend more time reading the story and grasping the idea behind the story and understanding everything. Some people even like to take notes as they read. And this, of course, will give more time for the reading portion. So you can probably take 10 minutes reading, 25 minutes writing, and five minutes revising. The only thing I don't like about this advice, because some teachers use um, the following division. They say, take 10 minutes to read, take your time, read it properly, take your notes, plan everything, and then take 25 minutes to write, and then just five minutes to revise at the end. I personally don't like that because I want to give you as much time as possible to write the essay. Because whether you like it or not, your final grade on the essay will be on what you have written. So it doesn't really matter how long you spend reading or how long you spend revising. What does matter is actually what you get written on paper. So I fear that if you spend too much time reading, you don't have enough time to write the essay and complete it on time. And if you do have enough time to write the essay, you don't have enough time to revise, which is also very important. So I think this is the best way to manage your time. Again, it differs from one person to the other. Some of you are fast readers, slow writers. Some of you are slow readers, fast writers. Okay, it depends on you. You need to try, but you should always finish before 45 minutes. Little tip here. This is one of our study tips that we will talk about, but let me just see it now. One of the tips is at home, when you do a practice essay, I want you to try to stick to 40 minutes total, not 45, okay? Because 45 minutes on test day feel like 40 minutes at home. Time is not the same, okay? Perfect. So this is the first point I wanted to talk about today when it comes to your essay. Let's talk about something else really quickly when it comes to essay. You need to write a five paragraph essay on the test. You can write a four paragraph essay. You can write a one paragraph essay. You can write a hundred paragraph essay. You can do anything you want. They will read it. They will mark it. But if you want to do the most efficient thing, and the safest thing and try to get the highest score possible in the time given, you should stick to the five paragraph essay format. Why? The people who will actually grade your essay are human beings. They are teachers who work in BCA. Okay. Now those teachers who work at BCA, they teach other subjects. They have other responsibilities other than marking your essays. And if you pay attention, the time when they have your essays is in January. And the time they release the invitation letters for the interview is in February. So they only have a month or maybe even under a month to read and mark all the essays they got. This is while they have school and have other responsibilities. Okay. There is no vacation from January to February. 
school is um, full power. Okay, they might even have other tests, quarter tests, and so on. So they will not have so much time to read your essay. They will probably have only one or two minutes to read your whole essay. Do you believe that? You're going to spend 45 minutes writing the essay, and they will probably not take more than one or two minutes looking at your essay. Now, if you want to be smart, you want to make your essay as organized as possible so that they can find as many things that they want to find in your essay as quickly as possible. In one or two minutes, they look at your essay, they say, this is a good essay, they give you a good score. Okay? In order to do that, you want to arrange your essay in a way that they already expect, in a way that is user-friendly, in a way that is teacher-friendly. What are the five paragraphs that you will write? Paragraph number one is your introduction. Paragraph number two is your body paragraph one. And I'm going to call this point one. Paragraph three is your body paragraph two. I'm going to call it point two. Paragraph four is your third body paragraph. I'll call it point three. And then paragraph five will be your conclusion. Paragraph. Okay? Now, in our course, we go over the essay in details. In my book, I go over each of the paragraphs in details. We take so many samples and we explain so many things. Here, I want to give you this overview and give you some important tips and hacks. So the first hack was arranging your time and practicing at home with 40 minutes and arranging your time over the three things. The second hack here is organization. Organize your essay properly into these five paragraphs. The most important thing to have in your introduction and in your conclusion is your answer to the question. Remember, guys, you will have a short story. You need to read the story, then you need to answer a question about the story. In your introduction and in your conclusion, you must state your answer. The reader, the grader, must find your answer. Wait a minute. Sorry, guys. This thing just jumped all over here. Wait a minute, I'm coming back. Okay, one more time. So in your introduction and in your conclusion, you need to answer the question, okay? Remember, what is the question? The question will be asked on your test at the beginning of the story. Read the story, then answer this question. What is the question? Whatever it is. You need to answer the question. This is the main purpose of your essay. Do not ever, ever write an essay talking about the short story, critiquing the short story, paraphrasing the short story. Your one and only goal is to answer the question given. So you need to put the answer in both the introduction and the conclusion. The second thing here, I like to see something I call Hints on my three points. And I'm going to tell you what the three points are. And in the conclusion, I like to see a summary of my three points. So what are my three points? Basically, what I want you to do on the test is I want you to read the story. While you read the story, your head is thinking about the answer to the question. There was a question. Now read the story, and as you read, you're trying to answer the question. I want you to find a three-point answer. For example, let me ask you a question. Watch today's class. So this is read the story. 
I want you to watch today's class. Watch the video of today's class when it's done. Then answer the following question. What are the difficult aspects of the Bergen County Academy's admission process? You need to choose three difficult aspects, three points to give me in your answer. Then you need to write an essay and tell me the Bergen County Academy's admission process is difficult because of three things. One, two, three. You need to choose three things. After you read the story, you choose three things to answer the question. Then, what do you do? In body paragraph number one, which is your second paragraph, you explain to me the first point, the first thing. In the next one, you explain the second thing. In the next one, you explain the third thing. So, basically, what are we going to do on the essay? Everybody pay attention. You read the story and you try to think of the answer to the question as you read the story. Then, you need to choose three points, three answers, three reasons, three problems, three benefits, three things that answer your question after you read the essay. In your introduction, you answer the question and you give me hints on the three points. You just, you know, tell me what the three things you will discuss are. Don't explain them. Just tell me what they are. Then explain the first one in details. Explain the second one in details. Explain the third one in details. Then in your conclusion, answer the question one more time and summarize the three points you explained here. Safe, straightforward, easy method of writing your BCA essay. Okay? Perfect. One more tip, one more hack for the essay portion of the Bergen County, Bergen County Academy's test. And let's do this. Pay attention, please. One more essay hack for the BCA test. In your body paragraphs, which are the three paragraphs in the middle that have the three points you will be discussing after you read your story, make sure that you must, must include proof from the story. So do not try to convince me with something without using proof from the story in each of the three body paragraphs. And proof from the story means quotations, quotes from the story. The hack is don't use too little and don't use too much. So if this is my body paragraph, one of the body paragraphs, you want this to be quotes and you want this to be everything else. So you want your quote to be about a third of the paragraph, maybe a little less. You don't want the whole paragraph to be a quote because that looks terrible. Some students just take a whole, a, a big chunk of the story and put it as a big quote and that's their body paragraph. That's wrong. Some other students quote very, very little from the story and that's also very bad. Okay. So your body paragraph should have a good, nice quote from the story proving your point, but it should be only what you actually need. Example, let's say, let's say, for example, and this will, I don't think will ever happen. The story you're reading is the story of Romeo and Juliet. Then there's a question in your essay that you need to answer. And this question has to do with sacrifice. Okay. And if you're familiar with the story of Romeo and Juliet, it is in part about sacrifice. Okay. If you want to prove that Romeo and Juliet sacrificed their lives for each other, then you should only quote part of the story that proves sacrifice, like the ending of the story when each of them um, kills himself or herself, presumably, 
in order to sacrifice their lives. You should not quote the whole story explaining to me who Romeo is, who Juliet is, where they were born, what families they came from, what happened between these two families, and the whole story. I don't care. This is all called irrelevant. You only need to quote the part that is relevant to the point you are making. Don't make it too long. Don't make it too short. Okay, guys? Okay. Now, I've been talking for a very long time. You guys are probably bored. And if you're not bored, say you're not. Try to encourage me a little bit. And if you are bored, please lie and tell me that you're not bored. Okay? I don't like bored people. Good. Okay. So, you guys are probably bored. I've been talking for a long time. And I don't want to bore you anymore. So, here's what I'm going to do. This is enough for the essay. I think you guys understand what I said. I will actually um, give you guys access to a video of an actual VCA essay for one of my actual students from, me, from years before who wrote an essay on a short story and I'm marking it. I'm reading the essay and I'm saying what's good and what's bad so you guys can watch that so you can understand more exactly what I mean. Okay? And I will use one of the videos um, that I use for the people who buy my book. Um, in the book, we, we discuss an essay called Eleven. It's, it's the, it's one of the actual, um, tests that came before in BCA and it's the sample essay that they had on their website. So I'll choose this one. So you guys are probably familiar with the story. You probably read it and you might even have written your own essay about it. If you do join our course, you're going to be writing 11 twice or maybe three times along with uh, a few other essays. So I'll give you that video and I'm going to tell you at the end how you can watch the video. Okay. And this way you guys get an extra you know, benefit, you can watch that video, okay? I'm going to tell you at the end. So, let's move on. Now we're left with two points that we want to discuss today. <sighs> done. Done. We want to talk about some study tips for the test and we want to talk about some test day tips what to do on testing pay attention we're almost done and this is super important um i know you I mean if you really study well for everything uh, you should be ready for the test and everything but i have some tips that i want to give you that hopefully will help you get ready even better okay ready let's do this okay everybody so now i'm going to talk about some study tips that you guys should follow starting today up until test day for the Bergen County Academy's admission test, BCA test. Okay, let's do this. So, number one, when you guys prepare for the test, you need to understand that are that are that there are two basic things. Number one is the actual content that is tested on the test. And number two are your hacks or your efficient tricks. These are two things you need to work on from now till test day. Now, the content is basically all the math you've learned in school since you were born, since you started school, makes more sense, okay? And um, you should do a thorough revision of all basic mathematics, middle school math, okay? If you go a little bit higher and start revising some algebra if you've taken algebra some geometry if you've taken geometry that's also good but you need to go over the basic stuff first fractions decimals arithmetic addition subtraction um, remainders um, adding and subtracting mixed numbers for example when it comes to fractions comparing decimals ratios and proportions comparing fractions which one is bigger than the other uh, basic perimeter rules, uh, area rules for just basic shapes, no real fancy geometry there. Um, algebra, simple algebra, okay? Uh, one or two variables in equations. You need to just be familiar with this stuff and you need to revise everything, basic mathematics that you've learned pretty much in the past three, four years at least, okay? Now, this can either be found in a book like our book and a course like our course, or you can self-study um, from any math, middle school math comprehensive book, something like, um, you know, I have those um, little, they're little but fat books, 
uh, everything you need to know about middle school math, everything you need to know about middle school English, there's something like that. You can search for books like that. It depends on you. Like, do you like this? Do you enjoy it? Can you get a book and read it by yourself? Or do you need someone to work with you? Just do a thorough revision of math. Okay. The other thing is writing. Just make sure you are doing well in school in your basic writing classes. Okay. You're able to organize your thoughts. Um, you don't have spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes. You have good handwriting. You're able to write clearly and quickly. You can read a short story and find the main ideas there and answer a question. You know how to write an essay, just the basic content of how to write. Again, this is something we cover in our course in books, and it is something that you should be working on by yourself or with us or with any other um, tutor or center. Then we come to the hacks, and this is where it really becomes interesting. You need to practice on not using your calculator. And this is really, really important. Why? Because a lot of you, a lot of us, have been so used to using calculators in school that we sometimes don't know how to do things that we should know how to do without using a calculator. And because the BCA test, the math portion, does not have a calculator, does not permit the use of calculators, you need to learn some shortcuts, which I call hacks, that will help you be able to answer such questions quickly and efficiently without using calculators. And this is especially important because now the SAT test also has a no calculator section. So if even if you're not taking the BCA test now, sooner or later, you're going to have something like this on the SAT, and you will still need to do some math without using calculator. Okay, so basic um, hacks like we learned in our live class and in our course, basic things that can, you can look at answer choices and, you know, try to guess which of the choices are the best answer choices. You can look at uh, questions that have a lot of uh, fractions added and subtracted to each other and basically guess whether the result is going to be proper or improper and choose the best answer accordingly. You look at a question that has lots of negative numbers and positive numbers, but you can basically deduce really quickly whether the answer will be a positive answer or a negative answer. All these things will help you find the answer quickly on the test. So this is something you should prepare for, look for, and work on and study. The other thing, of course, if you want to call this hacks, is to write the essay on time. And this is a challenge because a lot of um, a lot of my my students, those who are, who are good in, um, at writing, after they you know they practice, they take the course and everything, they write really really good essays. Okay, things I think that, you know, it's 100% guaranteed that they're going to do well. But they still have a problem with time, okay? They feel that they're very tight with time. And if they don't adjust the time at home before the test, what happens is if you go take the test and you find that your timing is really bad, you start to lose it. You start to lose everything you've been doing for the past couple of months. And you start, you know, writing anything, making mistakes, going very quickly, forgetting things you need to put and the result is a mess. So you need to practice at home a lot, okay? Time yourselves and make sure you're comfortable writing the essay, not in 45 minutes like on test day, but 40 minutes maximum at home, okay? So these are a few tips here So for, for what you should be doing um, basically when you're prepping for the test. Now, another tip or two, pay attention please, is here. Let's take a look. Let me just get this out of the way. Ooh. Let's get this out of the way, and this out of the way, and this out of the way. Okay. Now, one more thing I want you guys to um, prepare and work on while you prep for the BCA test is super important. It is practice questions. Now, the Academy's BCA, they had something really good, and they stopped this really good thing about two or three years ago. Okay, they used to have on their website a section where they had a lot of practice tests and practice sets. They had like four tests and seven practice sheets or, pra or practice sets. Recently, they removed those. Okay, I'm not sure if they're going to put them back on the website as the test approaches so you guys can, can prep using this material or not, but it was really, really beneficial. Release tests by the Bergen Academies. Now, we have questions, um, those questions released and questions like them that I wrote. And when I write a question, when I make up a math question, for example, practice question, um, I don't try to make up a question that is difficult or a question that is easy. 
I try to mimic the questions that they have as closely as I can without repeating the same thing because it wouldn't be beneficial if you answered the same question twice. So I try to use the same ideas, but change them into different questions. So that's why it's really important when you practice, whether you practice from the actual material that they had out, whether you get it from one of the books out there from, you know, search the internet, I don't know where you're going to get them. If you're going to take them in our course, for example, whatever you're going to do, whatever questions you're going to practice, practice real questions or questions that mimic the real questions like I do. Okay, don't practice with other materials. So don't practice SAT questions to take the BCA test. Don't practice um, questions from SHSAT or the um, uh, SSAT. You know, there are other, I know some of you are taking some of those other tests, like for Catholic school or other um, high schools um, or private schools they're not the same okay they could be similar in some in some aspects but they're not exactly the same so try to practice using questions as close as possible to those actual questions now this being said there is a practice test on the bca website if you go to the bergen academy's website and you go to the admissions i think and then downloads um i i forget what it's actually called there. You will find a practice test on the BCA website. It's a 40 question test and they do have the answer key for that. I recommend that you do take this test right now before doing anything, before prepping, before doing anything. Take the test with time and see your score. Then prep and work and do everything you do and do all your practice and then retake this test again um, right before the actual test and see where you are now, you should be much better, hopefully. Okay, so this is what I want you to do when it comes to practice. As for the essays, I said you need to practice with time, you need to adjust your time properly, so you can be ready for the test. Okay, one more thing. There's another way of prep, another um, idea when it comes to prepping for the BCA test, other than just practicing math and essay for the test. Let's take a look. Whenever you have a big test coming up, whether it's the SAT, ACT, BCA, any other type of test, you need to train your body and you need to train your brain to be ready for the test. So here are some tips. Pay attention, please. Number one, you need to have fixed sleep times. Eight or nine hours every night should be what you should be shooting for, and you should sleep at a certain time and wake up at a certain time that these times should correspond to the times that you will wake up and sleep on the night of the test and the day of the test so for example if and this may pertain more to to like older students taking the sat for example they don't go to school that often or they have a mixed schedule or something they may sleep and wake up at different times uh, during different days of the week but in all cases you need to think of it this way I have a test on Saturday. I need to wake up at 6 a.m. on Saturday. So I need to sleep at 10 p.m. on Friday. Do not wait till the Friday, which is the night of the test, to sleep at 10 p.m. and wake up on Friday at 6 a.m. You won't be able to if you're not used to these times. So as soon as you can, okay, as early as possible, start sleeping at the right time and waking up at the right time. Number two. Wake up every morning as you would on test day. So wake up the same time, even if it's a weekend, like the week or two before the test, even on weekends, okay? Train yourself to sleep and wake up like you will on test day. So for example, most tests, most standardized tests, most tests like the Bergen Academy's test, the SAT test, the ACT test, most tests are held during the weekend on Saturday or Saturday or Sunday. Okay, so if you are used to sleeping late on Friday and waking up late on Saturday and Sunday, you need to adjust this at least two weeks before the actual test. You need to sleep early and wake up early during the weekends so that you don't have a problem on testing. Make the test as familiar as possible to yourself. When you do a practice test at home, make sure the timing that you use is very similar to that of the actual test and should always be a little bit less than the time you have on the real test. The setting. Do not take a practice test while lying down on your bed. Okay? 
do not take a practice test in the kitchen next to everybody else going and coming in your home. Do not take the test in a place where there is noise. Take the test in a setting similar to the setting that you will actually take the real test on. So choose a room in your home that is empty, okay, somewhat, that is far from all the commotion. Get a desk, get a chair, sit down, put your papers, and take your practice test, okay, just like you would on testing. I even go farther and recommend that my students wear the clothes they will wear on test day or very similar clothing. So I don't recommend that you take a practice test wearing your pajamas, okay? I recommend that you take your practice tests at home wearing actual street clothes, clothes that you will wear on test day, okay? And that may include your shoes because the clothes you wear on test day are not as comfortable as the clothes you wear at home. And I don't want you to be more comfortable at home than you will on the test. I want you to be the same so that you are actually mimicking everything and practicing perfectly well, okay? It's like, let's say you practice soccer, for example. Imagine practicing soccer at home by kicking a ball to the wall wearing your pajamas. That's not really soccer practice. To practice soccer properly, you wear your soccer uniform and you go to the soccer field and then you practice, right? Makes sense. So it's the same thing. Study in short learning episodes. Your brains can only take so much information and can only take so much or give so much focus and concentration in any given amount of time. Do not try to cram and study a lot of things and work, uh, do a lot of things in a very um, long period of time. So don't say I'm going to study one day per week and in this one day I will spend eight hours preparing for my test. That does not work. Okay, you're better off working four days per week and each day two hours. In all cases, whether you have to work one day for long hours or many days for shorter hours, each learning episode, each time you sit down to work, should be limited to a short amount of time. I suggest using something called the Pomodoro Technique. To make the Pomodoro Technique into a simple, easy-to-use method, let's just say that we will sit down to study any given concept, any given idea, answer any practice set or practice test or practice sheet in about 25 to 30 minutes maximum. Then we will take a couple of minutes break, not a lot, two minutes, five minutes maximum. Then we will come back and study for another 25 or 30 minutes and so on. Do you understand? So let's say you have two hours of work today. Instead of sitting down from 8 to 10 for two hours continuous, you should sit from 8 to 8.30. Then take five minutes break. 8.35 to 9.05. Five minutes break. 9.10 to 9.40. Five minutes break. 9.45 to 10.15. So instead of working from 8 to 10, you worked from 8 to 10.15. You spent an extra 15 minutes. These were three breaks you took in between. This is much more efficient than sitting down for two hours straight studying. Okay? You will benefit more and you will remember more. And this applies to anything you guys study. Okay? Next, practice focusing on your test and blocking all outside stimuli like noise. It's really important to practice focusing on the test, okay? It's not about, well, I didn't do well on the test because I couldn't focus because it was too noisy. That's being passive. You need to, before test day, practice at home, sitting down and taking a test even if there is noise. You need to practice blocking that noise. You need to practice focusing on what you're doing because on test day, you cannot control the environment around you. You can't control the proctors. You can't control the teachers. You can't control the other students. You can't control the weather. There are a lot of things you can't control during test day. Okay, it can't be an excuse. 
that the room was hot, so I didn't do well. The room was cold, so I didn't do well. The proctors were chatting with each other, so I couldn't do well. The student next to me was crying, so I couldn't do well. The student behind me had a cold and kept on coughing and sneezing the whole time, so I couldn't do well. You can't do that. You need to practice at home, okay? Have some noise, have the annoying brother or sister around you, and practice blocking all this and focusing on your test. It is a skill you need. Next. Your brain is alive. Talk to it and keep it focused. Wait a minute. What does that have to do with study tips for the test? Listen to me. We have, human beings, something so precious and so important and so unique. We have the ability to realize that we are thinking when we are thinking it's like when i'm thinking about something i'm not just thinking about this thing i also realize that i'm thinking i'm thinking about that i'm thinking do you understand and this is something unique scientists say that only human beings have this okay we realize when we're thinking about something it's like we have two brains one that's working thinking studying doing something and another one that's looking on top and saying oh i know what you're doing okay since we have this unique um, brain structure, we can use this to our benefit. During the test, or during studying, now we're talking about studying for the test, your brain will drift away. You will lose focus. You'll start thinking about unimportant things. You will start thinking negative thoughts. You will start procrastinating. But because you're a human being, this does not happen entirely unconsciously or subconsciously or without your will because your brain realizes what you're doing you see and you, you can you guys can tell me if i'm right or wrong how many times has it happened to you when you study you drift away you start thinking about other things other than what you're actually reading or doing it happens a lot but when it does happen you guys realize that you actually know that this is what you're doing okay and if you imagine this you can pretty much imagine that you have two brains. One that's drifting away from what you're studying, going somewhere else, and another one that can see that, but is just sitting there doing nothing. This is where it has to come in. Your other brain that can see that you're drifting away needs to call this first brain and say, come back, okay? Talk to your brain, come back, focus. We have studying to do now. We have a test next week. We have a test next month. Stop thinking about other things. Let's finish this first. And then let's think about something else. Okay? So your brain is alive. Talk to it and keep it focused. Practice this. <sighs> One more. I have a very important study tip for you guys. And it has nothing to do with studying. The tip is make sure you know why you are studying what you're studying. Make sure you understand why the test you are studying for is important and why in order to score well on this test, you need to sit down and study now properly. This is so important. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing. If you're taking the test because your parents told you to take the test, if you're taking the test because your friends are taking the test, if you're taking the test because it's something you should do, your brother and your sister have done it before, so you have to do it as well, this is not beneficial. You don't have important reasons. You don't have important um, motivators to help you study and prepare for the test. You need to sit with yourself, and I can't help you here, and your parents can't help you here. This is something that is, that's up to you and you only. You need to sit with yourself. Why am I doing this? Why am I going to take this test? Because I want to go to this high school. I want to go to this university. That's why I'm taking this test, because if I get a high score, I'll be able to go to this private school. I'll be able to go to this university. I'll be able to go to this college. Because if I do, I can 
pursue my dream of becoming a doctor. If I do, I can pursue my dream of doing so and so. You're doing it for yourself. Maybe you don't care about the school you end up in or you don't, you don't care about the university you end up in, but you care about achieving something great. Getting a high score on this test is a great achievement. It is something you will be proud of. Okay, everybody else will be proud of you, but you will be proud of yourselves. And I always tell my students this, and I experienced this when I was your age. I always thought, well, all I need to do is realize what university I want, what I want to study in college. Then see what scores I need to get, what grades I need to get for this particular field that I want to study, and just get this score and I'm done. And then just get this score and I'm done. So it's basically like saying, what's the minimum SAT score to go to this school? The minimum SAT score is 1,400. Okay, I'm going to get 1,400, then I'm going, I'm not going to do anything else. Okay, but that's not true. I realized later on that that's not the way you should think. You should think of achieving the utmost that you can, achieving the highest that you can, getting the best possible score. Doesn't matter where you end up at the end. It doesn't matter what you do later on with that score, but do your best and get the highest score you can. Okay. You will always be proud of what you've done. So please guys, before you start studying and before you start prepping for whatever test you have next, sit down with yourselves and understand why you're doing this, why it is important and realize that since you have a test and you know it's important, there's only one way to reach that score, that achievement you want. It is by studying, studying hard, practicing, practicing a lot. Okay? There's no other way. Okay, guys. Ah, we're almost done. Did I bore you yet? Let me drink some water. Um... I do not know, Zachary. I know they look at the... The park, the P-A-R-C-C -C test. Um, are, are you homeschooled or do you go to middle school? A public school. Okay. Um, if, I mean, if the Terranova or the Iowa test, okay, private school. If they are uh, requirements in your school district or at your school, they probably will look at them. If it's something optional that you did by yourself or at school, they might not. Again, I don't know, and I think you should ask them, okay? But you should still do the best you can here, okay? We're almost done, guys. <sighs> Today, I want to discuss with you some test day tips, what to do on test day. Now, we already covered before that before the test, you guys should sleep well. You guys should wake up um, in the appropriate time. Um, give yourself plenty of time before the actual start time of the test. So if the test starts at 8 a.m., for example, be at the place where you need to be before 8 a.m. with a long time, okay? Um, always consult the time that you should arrive at, a, um, at the test center with the test administrators. So if they say you should be at the test center at 7 a.m., be there at 6.45, be there at 6.30. If they say you need to be there at 8, be there at 7.45. Make sure you have enough time so that you're not stressed out before the test. Make sure you account for traffic, you account for everything else so that you are there on time, okay? So, test date tips. When we talk about test day, you just need to realize a few things. Number one, you need to sleep well before the test. You need to eat well the morning of the test, breakfast, and you need to be early to the test, okay? And as much as possible, you should avoid talking about the test before the test with anybody. So on your way to the test, don't talk with your friends about the test about your prep, about what's easy or hard, what you're afraid of, what you're scared about, how confident you feel or how uh, not confident you feel. 
uh, try not to talk to your parents about the test. Okay, if your parents start asking you, are you ready? Did you study? Did you do this? Did you do that? Do you remember? Just ask them, please, let's not talk about this now. Try to not talk about the test with anyone. And when you go to the test center, to the school, before you take the test, if you see your friends, you see anybody there, try not to talk about the test at all. Um, try not to distract yourself with anything else. Just think about your plan. Think about everything you've studied. Keep it all inside your head. Don't bring it out. Focus, focus, focus. Don't talk as much as possible to anybody. Okay? Now, during the test, I want you to remember what we talked about before. We said before that you should practice at home, ignoring anything outside your study session. So your um, brothers and sisters and noisy neighbors and parents and TVs and everything happening at home while you're practicing um, should uh, not be avoided completely. You should keep a little of them when you are studying and practice focusing on your studying and not being distracted so that on test day, you can be able to ignore everything else outside your paper. During the test, I want you to ignore anything outside your paper. You should have practiced at home, um, ignoring anything outside of your study session, all the noise at home, all the um, confusions or all the distractions. You should have practiced how to you know, ignore all this and focus on what you're doing at home. Same thing during the test, always ignore anything outside the paper. Do not be tempted to look around you, see what other people are doing, see uh, if they seem to know what they're doing, if they're having a hard time, they're having a, an easy time, how the teachers look, how the school looks, what people are wearing, how the lighting looks, what the desk looks like, how many people are in the room, how many tiles are on the floor, how many lamps are there, how many bulbs are there in the room, how many windows. Stop doing things that our brains tend to do whenever we go to a new place but rather focus on your paper only. Your brain is alive. Talk to it and keep it focused. We talked about this before. If you feel yourself going somewhere else, your brain is drifting away. You're thinking about something else. You're thinking about what you're going to do after the test. You're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. You're thinking about other stuff. Forget everything else. Come back. Look at your paper. Talk to your brain. Make use of any breaks to fire up your brain. Now, depending on the test you're taking and depending on where you're taking the test, you may have a break, you may not have a break. If you do have breaks, and this is a you know general advice for whatever test you guys are going to be taking in the future, try to make use of any break. And do the same, guys, please, when you're studying at home and you have breaks in your study sessions. Do three things. Exercise, just walking Two minutes is exercise. It's considered exercise. So you stand up, you walk around your desk, you go back and forth for two minutes. That's exercise. Eat, eat glucose. Glucose is a very important brain fuel and your brain needs glucose to function properly and focus and work on the test. You can get glucose by eating 60 grams of dried fruit. So you can buy dried fruit, bring it with you. If you're permitted to bring food with you, and permitted to eat that during the break. If you have a break, eat 60 grams of dried fruit. This will fuel your brain with enough glucose to keep on moving on for a few more minutes. Drink water, one glass of water, um, gets that glucose to your blood stream quickly and therefore to your brain faster because water with the glucose goes into your blood, goes to your brain, quickly fuels the brain. Now, usually you will feel the effect of the extra focus that you got from exercising because you give oxygen as well to the brain and um, eating, which is the glucose and drinking, which is the blood flow that goes to your brain. You feel the effect after about five minutes and the effect lasts for about 30 minutes. Then you tend to get tired again like you were before. So make use of any break, whether it's at home or during the test, if you're permitted to eat, drink, and walk. Do these three things. You should feel better and focus better on the test. Okay, guys. Now, we had um, uh, another question. Uh, you can ask it again if you have the question again, please. The question was about uh, test scores. I'm not sure what it was. It, it disappeared when, when we got disconnected. Um, you can ask me again if you want. I think it was, who was it, Matt or Brian? Zachary, I don't remember. One of you guys, you, you wrote um, a 
question here. Uh, they they look at everything you send them. Okay. Now, when you print the forms, uh, the transcript forms, and you give them to your guidance counselor, you will see there exactly what scores they um, request. I do know for sure. Um, this is what they've been doing uh, recently: is that they get your school grades. So what you've done um, in the first quarter of school. Uh, the second quarter, if there are any grades that are out already, they look at your scores from the previous year, and they also look at the um, New Jersey um, mandated uh, state test, like the PARCC, and stuff like that. So what else do they look at? What do they not look at? I'm not really sure, and I know that they change that every year, so I'm not sure what they will be looking at this year. Um, it really shouldn't make a difference to you, because if they request it, your school has to send it. If they don't, your school will not send it. So if it's good, your school won't send it, even if it's good. If it's bad and your school has to send the score, they will send the score. So all you can do is prepare for the test. And this is my final note for today then i will let you go I'll, really quickly my final note is the whole admissions process for the bergen county academies is difficult it's a long road it's not easy okay but if you focus really well you will realize that there is only one variable in this whole process in this whole equation it's your preparation for the test you can't control your school grades from last year. You can't control the recommendation letters. You can't control how easy or hard the test will be. And you definitely can't control what you will do on the test. You don't know ultimately what you will do on the test. Okay? The one thing you can control is what you do from now until the test. Okay? Super important. So study well, prep well, and I hope you guys do perfectly, perfectly well. Now, I'm going to write here where you can find the um, essay. So if you guys go to our Facebook page, it's www.facebook.com slash Gouda BCA, one word, okay? That's our Facebook page. On the Facebook page, you'll find some videos over there. I will upload a video that has essay marking, okay, on the essay 11. So I'll prepare it and I'll upload it probably tonight or tomorrow. So you should see it on the page very soon. Go there, watch it, and please comment if you can using, I mean, either your, um, your account, if you have a Facebook account, or your parents' account, just so I know that you watched it. And let me know if you have any questions in the comment on the video that I will put there. Okay. And also follow the page because I do uh, put a lot of videos there and I'm intending on putting much more in the future. You can visit my YouTube channel. Do you use YouTube? Okay. So YouTube, if you search Gouda BCA, uh, you'll find, uh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. You'll find some videos there. You'll definitely find essay videos. So you can, you can watch those if you don't watch them. Uh, on YouTube. So uh, I want to make this easier for you. Let's see. What else? Do you guys use Instagram? Okay. So go to Instagram, go to BCA, follow. Um, Instagram, the problem is I, I can't post long videos there, but I do put things that, you know, uh, uh, tips and, and stuff that have to do with the test. And I'm going to be preparing a lot of shorter videos to put there. So follow that. But the video you'll find on the Facebook group, the Facebook page, I'm sorry, it's not a group, it's just a public page or on the YouTube channel and also on Instagram. Take a look there. I hope I benefited you guys. Good luck and keep me posted. I hope you guys do perfectly well on the test.